All right. We're going to go see this uh, uh, power plant on uh, on Friday. Uh, it's a it's a very standard, very pretty small uh, what's called a vapor power cycle uh, plant. Uh, the the schedule has us looking at what are called air standard power cycles first in chapter nine. But since we're going to go see a vapor power cycle plant on Friday, I've switched chapters 9 and 10 in the schedule, and we'll finish with the air standard cycles. Uh, that's the power cycle that you have in your cars and trucks and motorcycles that we'll finish the term with. And so we'll look at the vapor power cycle now. It's, it's far and away the most common of the uh, power production cycles used, um, well, certainly in America, if not, if not the world. The only thing that really changes is the uh, where the heat comes from, because uh, it, it all starts, well, it doesn't start anywhere since it is a cycle, but it all, it needs, of course, a, a boiler that's where the phase change comes from and the term the vapor power cycle. So we'll look at it on a TS diagram. We'll, uh, for the most part, look at ideal power cycles. We just don't have the time to look into a little bit more realistic power cycles. But um, there's a boiler with a high temperature uh, energy coming into it and the the main thing that changes from one cycle to the another is where that high temperature comes from. After that everything's pretty much the same. So uh, as the uh, vapor comes out of the boiler we'll call that state point one so that we can draw it as we go along the diagram. Uh, that can be done at a couple places. Generally, it's somewhere over to the right of the dome, um, coming through at the boiler pressure. So that would be P1, the, the uh, isobar along there. Um, just where we come out of the boiler, how long the fluid is left in the boiler, is determined mostly by what happens next because that high pressure, high temperature steam is then run through a turbine that will produce the work that we're looking for. Now, typically that's uh, attached directly to uh, an electrical generator from which is produced electrical power. Um, and by directly, I mean there most likely side by side and joined by uh, a direct physical connection of the same shaft running through the turbine and running through the generator. And I, if I remember, and Malcolm, I don't know if you're familiar enough with the, your plant to remind me, I, my, my belief is that's exactly how it is at INDEC. They have the steam turbine and then right beside it is the electrical generator because it's the turbine that's turning the generator. So they're right there. There's no reason to have them separated by any great distance. It's just a waste of space. And all those extra connections decrease the efficiency. Every little place you have to connect something or turn or do something, you lose a little bit of the power that's been produced. What we're going to see uh, on Friday is the steam turbine's going to be open. The, they need to maintain it uh, a couple times a year. They need to check the blades. They also need to rebalance it. It's spinning at, at many tens of thousands of RPM, and if it's not well balanced, it uh, it will just fly apart. Um, so where we come out of the boiler determines what uh, is going to happen in the turbine itself. If we try to save a little bit of heat and come out of the boiler just right at the saturated vapor line. So we've just now turned all the liquid 
water flowing through the plant into vapor. If we come out there as our point one and drop through the turbine, and remember we're looking at ideal cycles here, so we'll assume that the turbine is both adiabatic and isentropic, then uh, it's just a straight drop down like that to point two at constant entropy. Remember, we're looking at ideal cycles here, so we'll assume the turbine drop is uh, isentropic and that the pump compression on the other side that we'll get to in a second is also isentropic. The trouble with this is that we're well under the dome, which means there's an awful lot of liquid in that fluid stream now, which is very, very damaging to the later blades in the turbine where uh, you know, it comes in at vapor but then starts to condense a little bit as it goes along here, as it gets farther under the dome, until the, by the time you get halfway through the um, turbine or so, you've got an awful lot of moisture, an awful lot of liquid in the turbine hitting those blades and it's, it's like sandblasting the blades. They just don't last for very long. So it's not a, a, an optimum condition for us to get into so much moisture content here. So instead of that, we'll go up into superheat somewhere, just leave the water, make a bigger boiler, essentially is all they do, just let it stay in the boiler more. It takes more heat to do that, but now when we do the drop through the turbine, it's typically until just barely under the dome or just barely outside of it, but conditions are much, much better for the health and safety of the turbine itself if uh, let it go like that. At which point it's now run into a condenser. This just simply takes it back across the dome, returning it to uh, the liquid state where it comes out. Two reasons for that. One, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, any power cycle that we run, it's required that at some place there be the rejection of heat. Otherwise, it's a violation of, of uh, the uh, Kelvin Planck statement of the second law. It'd be nice if we could get all that energy we're dumping out there as usable work, but we can't. It's a violation of the, the Kelvin Planck statement. Um, plus, the very realistic fact that it's much easier to repressurize up to the boiler pressure. It's much easier to repressurize up to the boiler pressure if we're pressurizing a liquid than if we're pressurizing a vapor. It's just an awful lot cheaper. It's much, much easier to do. Uh, it'd be terrible to stop somewhere in here because two-phase compressors are very hard to design and to run well. So it just makes a lot more sense for the mechanics of the system to come all the way back to saturated liquid at which point we go back into the, a pump that brings it then back up to the boiler pressure and start again. Of course that takes a little bit of the work produced, but as we'll see very shortly, it takes very, very little of it. And again, we're going to assume that's isentropic up to 0.4 there. And so that's our simplest of all power cycles right there that we're going to look at. And again, we're going to take the assumption of ideal ones and uh, uh, analyze a, a couple of those as we, as we have time to do it. This is called a Rankine power cycle. So 
we're, we're looking at ideal ranking power, power cycles for, uh, uh, I guess, the next two class periods. Do this. And then there's things we need to analyze, of course, the thermal efficiency, which, as always for us, is the benefit over the cost. And the benefit is, remember, the net work, or net power in this case, if I didn't do it as a rate term, the net power. That's the turbine power minus the pump power. So whatever we produce in the turbine, we have to turn a little bit of it around, send it back to run the pumps. And of course, if we're looking at the entire plant, there's other stuff that needs to be run there, but we're looking at it just in terms of the power plant itself. And the cost, of course, is the Q dot H that we have to pay for. It's the Q dot H that makes the difference between all the different types of power plants that are, well, not all of them, but for the most part, all of them. It's where this heat comes from. Does it come from the burning of coal, natural gas, index a natural gas plant, right? Uh, INDEC uses natural gas uh, that we'll see on Friday. Well, we won't see any of that part of it on Friday. Um, if it's a nuclear power plant, all of this is exactly the same. It's just that the heat comes from the nuclear reaction of the uh, uh, the fission of the uranium in the, in the reactor core. But then that produces heat that boils a fluid and then everything else is, is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter even if, uh, even if we're talking about a solar power plant. That's the only difference is where does this heat come from? After we've got that heat, and then of course there's a huge effort on how to get cheaper and cheaper and cleaner and cleaner heat, but after we get that heat, everything else is pretty much the same. A little bit of difference where this heat goes, uh, does it go into, uh, uh, just into, the, uh, into a, a river running by or into the ocean, or is it pumped into the air? Uh, and that's what you see when you see the giant um, stacks like that with uh, beautiful billowing white steam. That is All that is is steam. There's nothing radioactive about that. Um, but that's just simply this, uh, uh, the release of the, the heat to the atmosphere there. So there's an atmospheric and environmental cost to that stuff. But we're looking at this and only in terms of the thermal cost of that. So that's the only difference of the, of the possible things we can do there. Other little changes that can be made are things like a... Uh, remember that the uh, net work equals the net heat transfer. And in general, the greater the area, the greater the both of those. But uh, the net, uh, the the thermal efficiency only depends upon the heat added. So other things we might want to do is uh, lower the condenser pressure, which will then. Uh, add a little bit of area to it. That's a possibility. Um, part of the trouble is, is it does take the turbine farther under the dome, so there's more moisture in the turbine. It also, there's more troubles associated with uh, very, very low pressure condensers. Um, we might also do some things like uh, go to higher temperature here in the turbine that gives us less chance of going under the dome but we're already at 
pretty high temperatures. This is even higher temperature. That's going to come at a greater cost than QH. Also going to come at a greater cost than the equipment itself to handle that greater pressure. If we do a um, higher pressure on the turbine, that can compound things with not just higher temperatures, but also higher pressures, which uh, these this is the high pressure part of the cycle anyway, and is the most dangerous part of the cycle. In fact, uh, uh, I remember being told by a, 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 sh a sh submarine mechanic, I'm not, you were in the Navy, were you? No. Josh was, we need him in here for the term of whoever. The, anyway, one of the, one of the guys working in the boiler room in the uh, in a submarine, they worry about leaks forming in these pipes because it's a, such extremely high pressure that when they had to look for leaks, they'd be very very tiny leaks, but it's such high pressure. The way they'd find them is they'd take a broom and hold it over the head, and when the steam jet sheared off the the broom, they figured they'd found the leak. So. You don't want to go to even higher pressure yet to get things even more and more dangerous. I've heard that same story at Index, so it's no yeah. different there. They okay, so I just have them here to associate with submarines. Uh, well, that's I, I, I own a nuclear submarine that I got from uh, Ace Hardware. I use it in Lake George. <laughs> I'd give you rides, but it's it's small. It's a one per it's a one professor submarine. <laughs> So I can't take it for a while. All right, so uh, those are the kind of things we'll look at. We're going to add one more modification here that in general doesn't increase the danger of the situation of higher temperatures or higher temperatures and pressures. It complicates the mechanics a little bit, but it's a, a very common modification to this power cycle. Um, and we can we'll we'll analyze it here by the end of the class. And I I again can't remember if INDEC is one of those type of systems or not. But uh, we'll check when we get there. All right. So let's put some numbers to this kind of thing here. Again, just a real quick sketch of the system. Um, we're going to change that a little bit in a, in a second when we step through this. So, uh, get your tables out. We're going to use them. on this one or is that just we're doing this one on a per mass basis I guess so just W just Q okay just, just to pick some numbers to go around the plant that one, two, three, and four. Because what we need to do at each of the state points is figure out, uh, for the most part, what's going on. For example, um, to find the work that comes out of the turbine, goes in here somewhere at point three drops down somewhere to about here at point 4. It's that decrease in energy that is our turbine work and all we have to do is a first law balance on that since we're assuming these are ideal turbine, turbines, adiabatic, all that reduces to then is uh, the change in the enthalpy through the turbine. If we're looking at the power that's produced, all we need to do is multiply that by m dot. And we're assuming these are running at steady state, so m dot is a, can, uh, a constant. That's the 
mass rate flow through the, the system itself. And in the same way, for us to find how much heat is required, we just need the uh, to look at the change in enthalpy. No work is being done. We're assuming constant kinetic and potential energy. So all we need is then the change in the enthalpy for those two points as well. Or on a rate basis, So as long as we have our two independent intensive properties at any state point, we can find the enthalpy just looking it up out of the tables and make all the calculations we need. Run through the condenser, back to what I just happened to call point one there. Pressurize it back up to the boiler. Pressure and then run it through the boiler. So there's our simple cycle as we're going to look at it. What else? Do, oh, we might need the pump work. Now the pump work is uh, a little bit trickier at first until we figure out what's going on and realize it's a little bit less tricky. And uh, take me a, a second to put that together. So again, if we're assuming, oh, sorry, I don't want that to be a rate. If we're assuming this, these are ideal pumps and <coughs> turbines, then they're adiabatic. And so the first law uh, of the pump work just comes to be a difference again in the enthalpy between the uh, two points before and after it. So typically we have for state point three both the temperature and the pressure. So that fixes that state point. We can just go to the superheat tables, look it up, and that will give us then H3. That's very easy. Uh, in fact, uh, you can put numbers to that for this one. 3 megapascals, 350 degrees C. Just so we can work through some of these. And so that's up in superheat. That'll be easy for us to look at um, when we get a second. But we have to do that at all of the state points because we need to find the enthalpies at all of those different state points. It's quite typical that the condenser pressure is also given. So we would uh, have here um, P3 and of course P1 over here because those are the same no sorry not P3, P4 P4 those are the same P1 equals P4 because that's under the dome remember uh, that's a constant pressure line straight across there but to fix state point 4 we need some other independent intensive thermodynamic property. Not the quality, because that's not what's specified. We need something else. We might need the quality, but we don't specify the quality. What's so funny about quality? What? Use what? Use enthalpy? Which? And since it's isentropic, we're assuming it's an ideal turbine, it's isentropic, so our other state point for point four is the fact that it's the same entropy as at state three. Is that what you meant? Yeah. 
Should you said so. I tried. And since we have state point three fixed, we can get the entropy. So not only do we need the entropy, the enthalpy at state point three, we're also going to need the entropy because then we carry that down to four. So that's those two, H3 and H4. H3 we'll use again here. Um, we need to fix H2 and H1 as well. So again, we need two state points, or two intensive properties to fix the state point. We have the pressure at point one as the condenser pressure. What's our other intensive property for state point one out of the condenser and into the pump. The what? We don't have the temperature. Remember, underneath the dome, temperature and pressure aren't in. Well, we have the temperature, but that's fixed by the pressure and vice versa because they're not independent under the dome. Is that what you're going to say, Chris? Yeah, I was just going to say because it's on the, on the dome, on the curve. We assume that we've gone right to the point of saturated uh, liquid. And so uh, the quality of point one is zero, and we take that to be a specified property. That's ideal, though, right? That the quality is going to be zero. Uh, that's good enough. Because remember, if you've looked at the compressed liquid tables, they're very, very sparse. There's just not much there because very little changes. And in fact, we're going to use that. Let's see, we've now fixed state point one to our satisfaction. Um, H2, which we could find by assuming constant entropy from H1. H1 will be easy to find. It's just SF in the table at that pressure. And then we go to the compressed liquid table. But there's not much there to the compressed liquid table. So H2 itself is not very easy to find. What we can do, though, very easily, is remember that this is an incompressible liquid. And therefore, the work being done is really nothing more than the specific volume times the change in pressure, which would be P2 minus P1. And we have both of those pressures because P1 is the condenser pressure, and P2 is the same pressure all the way through the boiler. This all the way along here is a constant pressure line all the way through the boiler. So we'll use that fact. It's a little bit of an approximation, but the difference it makes is very, very small in terms of calculating the pump work. And as we'll see, the pump work itself is also very, very small. So only thing else we need is a condenser pressure. So let's put the condenser pressure at 75, 70, 75 kilopascals. Okay, so we can analyze this whole pump. Just given the two pressures and the temperature, we can do all the thermal analysis we need to do of the pump.
So we can start any way we want. We'll go ahead and start at the top of the turbine in the superheat tables. And our pressure there is three megapascals. <coughs> so that's on the table on 921, I believe. There's three megapascals. And we're at a uh, temperature of 350. So that's right along there. Uh, the 350 is off the left. You know we're in superheat because the saturation temperature is 234. And we're all the way up at 350. So remember, at state point three, we need both the enthalpy, but we also need the entropy. So to save yourself some time, get them both at that point when you need them. And keep your stuff organized because there's lots of stuff to look up. This is the enthalpy. This is the entropy. So our enthalpy is 316, sorry, 3116 kilojoules per kilogram. And the entropy is 674. So that's state point three. It's as simple as that. How do we find state point four? The next enthalpy we need to find the turbine work produced is by finding state point four. We already know the pressure. That's 75 kilopascals. How do we find state point four? We're under the dome, so we go to the saturation tables at that pressure. So we go to the saturation pressure tables at 75 kilopascals. kilopascals. We know we're under the dome somewhere. What we have to do is first realize that the entropy is the same because we're assuming an adiabatic constant entropy and isentropic turbine drop. So we know that that entropy must be found somewhere along this line as SF plus X2, whatever the quality is along that point, times SFG, where the SF and the SG are right out of the table at the pressure Um, of the condenser, the 75 kilopascals. So that allows us to find the quality at point two. Then with the quality at point two, we find the enthalpy at point two using that number we just found with the same values from the table. So you can see there, you can see all those numbers there for the 75 bit, uh, kilopascals. There's SF and SFG, which we need for these two numbers to find the quality. Once we find the quality, we need HF and HFG. The other two in the, in the columns here. What? Is 
Sure, why not? Yeah, of course. I don't know where the two came from. Imagine you being awake not to guess. Wow. Fiona, when you're awake and here in class, you're awesome. I know. What? Yeah. Yeah, if you if you'd come to strength of materials. The uh, yeah, look, Dana's back there going, I don't know what's going on. I was here for strength of materials, I'm all confused. And Trevor. I was the first one here. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was. Alright. Find those those little bits uh, so we can put it all together. Find the quality at point four and uh, that's just a matter of solving that equation for x4 and pulling those numbers right out of the table. S4 we've already got because it's the same as S3. 6.745 SF is right out of the table. There it is right there, 1.213. Generally, you don't get in a whole lot of trouble if you drop off the last uh, decimal point. And then SFG, remember that's conveniently calculated for us here, uh, 6.243. And that'll give us the quality at point four. <coughs> Use that then to find the enthalpy at point four. And that's also up there on my visible. So you can do that part. If you don't have your tables, that's fine. The table you need for point four is up there. HF for here is right out of the table. Right. And is that also H1? Yes, that's also H1. HF is there, HG is over there, and we're looking at H4 in between the two. So that's that's uh, that's what this is doing, is calculating a distance along between the two. Am I okay with the tables? Get used to them. Get used to them. Two and a half weeks left. Too late now. Look at your shoes are so warm. You you loved your tables. Those are well loved tables. <coughs> Trevor, you're using the tables on that thing? Or have you figured out some place to get them all? Well, I'm, I've been trying different apps to see if there's any good numbers for the problems. There's mostly a lot of websites.
Yeah, you can get with well, phones sometimes need passwords and stuff. The calculators don't. Do whatever you want. Lunch. Go down there and get lunch. Somebody will get walk away and take their lunch. And you don't have to beat them up in the hallway and stuff them in a locker. Like you used to in high school. Oh, I was used to in the locker. Don't forget this quality should be a number between zero and one. If it isn't, you've calculated something wrong. If it's negative, you calculated something wrong. Maybe you just wrote it down wrong, but uh, remember that's the fraction of the fluid that is uh, the vapor. So we typically talk about it as a percent. Anybody have that number? 88.6. And it should be very high. because we're way, way over to the right of the dome. And then, uh, now you can find the enthalpy of that point. 384 plus 0 0.886 and then times HFG, just on this one here. HFG 2278. And that'll be kilojoules per kilogram. Is that right? Paul, you got those numbers? Got H4? Again, you can check that to make sure it makes sense because it should be somewhere in between HF and HG. If it's not, you screwed something up and you got to fix it. Should be right between those two numbers. Remember, HFG is the distance between those two numbers, and so 0.4 should be right in between there. Okay. We're not doing it on a rate basis. So now we can tell what the turbine work is. It's um, 3116 minus what we just found in 2403. What's that come out to be? 1,313? That's no. That's uh, how much energy per kilogram of fluid flowing through the um, turbine would produce. It's just seven hundred thousand. But in my head, yeah. So that's the, the first part, remember, of the thermal uh, efficiency that we need. Okay, so we've got that. Uh, doesn't matter what order you do these things in, you got to do them sometime, someplace. So QH, I guess, will be our next one. H3 minus H2. H3 we already have because that's the enthalpy going into the turbine. Notice that we're discounting any of the piping between these components. There are pressure drops, heat losses, entropy losses in there. Uh, entropy increases in there, but we're ignoring them uh, since, again, this is an ideal power cycle. So, to find point two, H2, which we need uh, going into the boiler, 
probably easier to get to that by going from the pump. But remember, H2 is very uh, difficult to find directly, so we'll find it by finding the specific volume times the delta P. Uh, remember our, our uh, flow work was PV. This is then the derivative of PV with V being constant since it's incompressible. So, V1 is this number here. It's VF because we're all the way over on the left side of the dome at point one at that pressure of 75 kilopascals. 001. Meters cubed per kilogram. Then the pressure change, we go from three megapascals down to 75 kilopascals. That's what, 2,000 and 20, 2,925 kilopascals. Is that right? Because that's 75 kilopascals, that's 3,000 kilopascals. And once you've done that, then you can solve for H2 and just use that if you need it, which, which we do because so we need it for the uh, high temperature. So you do that, but fix the units first. the units. Remember we're looking for kilojoules per kilogram. Got kilogram. We're now, oh, almost there. We got Newton meters now. So all we need to do is make it kilojoules. Thank you. That'll do it. So we didn't need to do it. But it's good to check. It's good to check. It's good to check. All right, so that comes out to be then, what? system. Notice, however, 
how small the pump work is to the turbine work being produced. So there's two things we can do with that. One is we can define the back work ratio, which is how much of the turbine work produced do we need to send back to the plant to help it run. So that's just the pump work over the turbine work. And it's usually very small. You try to keep it very small. Kind of like the expense uh, ratio on, on the mutual funds that you all invest in. With your steward's paychecks. Sad investors. So what's that come out to be? 303 divided by 713. What? Point zero point four three percent. Zero point four three percent. So very very small. Which leads us to the second thing we can do with the pump work, which is just ignore it. It's so small. If you're in a hurry. But then I know that old trick. I specifically ask for the pump work on tests, so you can't just say, "Oh, it, uh, I'm neglecting it." So I'm neglecting this problem too, and the points that come with it. But now we can use that to find H2 because we already had H1. Uh, I don't think I have it on the board anymore. Oh, it's up here because that's HF 384.4. So H2 equals. 3.03 plus, what was it, 3.44. But again, not a whole big deal of difference, but uh, at least we've got it. And then we can find the heat added, and that will allow us now to find the uh, thermal efficiency. H3 we've already got. One. As you go along there's less stuff you need to find because you're getting more of the things as you go around of course. And that's that's what? 387? And that's how much heat we need to add to uh, run the plant. How much is that? I'm not going to do it in my head. That one's too hard. It's got eights and sevens in it. And so now we know the uh, efficiency. 710, that's the 713 minus the 3 to run the pump over Two seven two nine. Right? And so the thermal efficiency is what then? How much? Twenty six percent. If we ran a Carnot cycle between the same two, same limits, what would that be? That would be the ideal efficiency we could get. This is an ideal cycle, but it's not a Carnot cycle. Remember, a Carnot cycle on a TS diagram is a square. So we have all that area that we're losing to the, uh, the fact that we have a, a, a regular vapor cycle rather than a Carnot cycle. Remember how to find the Carnot efficiency? H 
where the high temperature is the 350, the low temperature is whatever we had there. I don't think we had it, so I'll give it to you. Turns out to be, oh, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's right there, 92. But remember, that has to be in Kelvin. So, 90, 92 plus 273 over 350 plus 273. And that will be the Carnot efficiency. Fifty-seven. Oh, I had forty-one percent. So about forty-one percent, which then allows us to define yet a brand new efficiency, which might call a second law efficiency which is the comparison of how we are doing with this plant to how we could have done if we had a Carnot cycle running there. Just a, a sort of a measure of how close we got to ideal. Now, for example, uh, you want to know how close you got to ideal and you're picking your mate on, I don't know where, okcupid.com? you'd want to be much higher than this percent. You'd want to be like 98% or you'd want your money back. So that's the kind of thing we're thinking there. Just, just, just to make sure. Because we don't want to screw up that calculation. No. Right, Trevor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Trevor's getting married. Did you know that? Oh yeah, I forgot. I'm the last to hear everything from this group. So you guys have known for months. I'm just now finding out. Well, fine. <laughs> okay. Questions about that before we look at... I give you one to do with, a, with an extra, uh, extra increase in efficiency added to it. The calculations are all still basically the same, but there's a modification made to the plant to increase the efficiency. So what we do with this design, and uh, I'll call that point one. What we do with this design is we send the vapor into the turbine. So we come out of the boiler at some point here, point one. We send it into the turbine where, of course, it isentropically drops down in pressure. Depending on just what the spe specifications are, maybe we'll stop. Uh, well, we want to stop somewhere very near the dome. Because remember, we don't want much moisture content. Pull the fluid out, and instead of sending it into the condenser there, because it may still be at very, very high temperature and have a lot of energy in it, what we'll do is send it back into the boiler to be reheated. So that'll be point two. Send it back into the boiler to be reheated. That will cause it to go back up something like this. Now, it's at a lower pressure, so it's not loose in the boiler. It's in, contained in, in, uh, in piping. So that'll be point two down here. And then we take that fluid and run it back into another turbine.
to produce yet even more work. And so our uh, turbine work is the two of those combined. It's a two-stage turbine. A high-pressure stage, we pull out the fluid, we reheat it, put it into the low-pressure stage, and get a little bit more work out of it. It does take some more heat, of course. Also, mechanically, it's a little more complicated, but it does increase the efficiency. Um, if we do the calculation here between the same temperatures, we'll find an increase in the efficiency by doing this. And then the rest of the plant is basically the same. Into a condenser and then into a pump and back into the boiler. So that's three. This is four. And six. It's called a reheat. So this is an ideal Rankine vapor cycle with reheat. That's using the two-stage turbine to uh, allow us to get a little bit more turbine work, use the boiler a little more efficiently. Okay, and I'll give you some numbers for that and you can start calculating through it. Uh, 480 degrees is the high temperature there, the pressure through the boiler, 8 megapascals. T3 is at 440, so not as high temperature, also lower, lower pressure, so there's quite a bit less energy in that fluid, but still plenty to run a turbine. The intermediate pressure here, and that'll be the pressure with which we go back into a, the boiler to go up the, the reheat. Let's uh, say that's 0.7 megapascals. And then the condenser pressure will put at 0 0.008 megapascals. And those five numbers are enough to specify the entire operation of that plant. So before we get going, let's double check what we've got and what we'll need. We have six state points. We already know that, uh, for example, to find out how much turbine power is produced in the high stage, we'll need H1 and H2. In the low stage, we'll need H4 and H3. How much is rejected by the condenser? And then we also need to find out how much work the pump requires. And we'll need the enthalpies at all those points, which means we need the uh, thermodynamic, two thermodynamic properties at each point. Point one, we have T1 and P1, and we're in superheat, so that one's no. Point two, we know the pressure where we come out of the turbine. 
the intermediate pressure is 0.7 megapascals. What's our other thermodynamic property at 0.2? It's isentropic from 0.1. Sorry, that's P2 there. So we have P2 and S1 we can use there. Three, we have the temperature and pressure. P3 is P2. Uh, and P3 is P2. So I guess we could write it that way if we want. Don't have to look up anything new. Point four, we know the pressure at point four. What else? Of course, the entropy from point three. So, looking ahead, you can you can anticipate what you need to look up at any point. That'll keep you from finding one thing at one point and then having to come back to it later. Point five is uh, the same pressure as point four. And the quality, we're the saturated liquid. So X equals our other independent thermodynamic variable. Oh, that's point six. And then the point six, um, remember we can, uh, we know the pressure, because that's the same pressure as P1. And that's the one where we'll uh, uh, use the, the uh, specific volume to find the, uh, the temperature or the pressure chain or to find the work done. Um, so we'll call that V uh, V5, I guess. Because it's the volume, specific volume from 0.5. So we're going to need the enthalpy for all of those. We need the entropy for some of them. We'll need S1 to find S2, to find point 0.2, then we don't need the entropy really at these other ones. Those two we don't need. Um, we're also going to need the quality at uh, a couple points, I guess, so I will put that in. That's point 0.2 and point 0.4, just to keep this kind of stuff straight. Oh, got too many axes here now. And we will need the specific volume at point five. I don't know if that'll do. So, if you can uh, pick out each of those points, then you'll have pretty much everything you need.
he has seven minutes to do it. Unless you came in late. And you've got eight minutes. You have to stay after. First values, of course, are up in super heat. And you'll need two there, so it might be worth just keeping the table open if you can, can happen to do it. You need, uh, we have two super heat points. May or may not be on the same page. Uh, oh, the 0.7 megapascals, you have to. Just take it midway between these two parts of the table at uh, 480 degrees. I'll make it 500, call it even. Or, or ask Trevor to look it up for you. He has an app. There's an app for that. Really, you go to the app store and look under thermodynamics? How much stuff came up? You would be surprised. I wouldn't be. There's so many nerds out there. With Free time. Good thing you're not one of them, anybody. Okay, so unfortunately for our tables, this is doing double interpolation. Which sucks. So I'll give it to you. Trevor can check this for us. Three, three, four, eight. You got it too? Yeah? How'd you get it? I have to record. The double interpolation? Wow, good man. Because not only do we have to interpolate between these two tables, since we're at 0 0.7 megapascals, but we're at two different temperatures on there, so it's, it's kind of a pain, but it's just a double interpolation. And it's, uh, it's a linear one, so. 6659 for the entropy. And that's the same entropy as that one, which will allow you to find the quality at point two. Uh, the once you found the quality at point two, you can find the enthalpy at point two. Quality is point nine eight nine. I'll give you a few of these just to get you going. Then you can find the enthalpy. Twenty seven forty two. How are we doing? points there, and then, and then uh, we'll be ready for Friday if we know how to analyze ideal power plants. And Malcolm's dad wouldn't run a non-ideal plant, would he? I would think it's an ideal plant. And what you'll see too is he has a big office, and he, he uh, got his degree here has started here too. So you guys will have a big office someday. He's a big shot up there in email. He runs the plan. He's my manager. So he can kick you out if he wants to. Because some people come in with a bad attitude towards them. They have other things on their mind.
you get pulled over for speeding or something and you're texting, just show that to the cops. Say, no, sir, I was looking up thermodynamic properties. Exactly. If I need any help on any of the spots, check with each other as you go along. You don't have to have an exact agreement, but pretty close, sure helps. You'll need to find the quality of 0.4. 0.3 I think is easier to find. Oh wait, no oh, wait. Point one wasn't a double interpolation. These were the eight megapascals. 480 degrees. So we have the right pressure, we just don't have the right temperatures. So it's a single inter interpolation. between the 500 and the 450 degrees. So 480 is just 60% away between those two. H3 is? Yeah, it is. See, that's the magic of... No, the magic of me having six or seven sets of tables to look at. Plus, all the online things, and now I know there's apps, and I can't wait to get back to my office and go to the app store. Anybody want to check any other numbers? Yeah, since H3 is an interpolation, too, I'll give you that. 3353. Because evidently Trevor won't give it to you. S3757 and that's that one well so it should be getting those ballpark oops so it's 757 and so that should give you a quality of 90 Friday and we can finish this one up next week and do another one with some other modifications.